There's one more speaker now um, I'd like you to listen to before you can go out and have lunch. And that's because when I came to Ireland five years ago, and I was looking for innovation within the built environment, someone said, oh, you need to speak to a colleague um, who's in the audience, um, who represents a Centre for Excellence in Universal Design, because I think you've got something in common, apart from, say, personalities. And part of it was really this, I began to, I went along a journey of understanding about this concept of universal design, emphasis on people, understanding what people need, um, and then also this cross-generational approach of say, the 7, the 17, and the 77-year-old. And it opened my eyes to a world of people over the age of 50, 55, 60, that, 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 that the, uh, the age limit seems to vary a bit, but really the older, older population. And it's one sector that's growing and growing and growing and growing in the world and uh, in Japan, for example, this is enormous at the moment. In Europe, it's going to become very, very significant. So anything we do with cities has to very much take account of the older person. So the, um, the last speaker I've got is Michael Foley from Age and Opportunity. He's kindly come along. I've, like Jim, roped you in to give this presentation. Is it Jim? It's me. Yeah. So, as I said, this is another perspective. Thank you, Jim. Thanks very much. I'm a bit low rise like Dublin, so I'm just going to move these mics down a little bit. Uh, my name is Michael Foley. I work with an organization called Age and Opportunity. And our role is we're the national organization that inspires everyone to reach their full potential as they age. So basically we're in the inspiration business and how we inspire people is through arts activity. Uh, we run the largest collaborative arts festival in Ireland. It's a national arts festival celebrating creativity in older age where we have 600 partners. We have over uh, 100,000 people take part and as you can appreciate it's a bit of a nightmare but it's a beautiful, gorgeous, fizzing with energy nightmare that we happily do each year during May. We have other arts activities that we do with older people. We also run the National Sport and Physical Activity Programme for older people. So we get 40,000 older people active every week, usually every week. And uh, we also support all kinds of health and physical activity programmes. And we are also involved in lifelong learning and active citizenship work. And that's what I'll talk about today because, as you can see from uh, Red Riding Hood there visiting her grandmother, uh, when I started to think about it, I thought a good, um, and I started to think about the theme for today, I thought that a good place to start would be, Grandma, what big data you've got? And looking at some kind of fairy tales that we tell in our heads about older people in the city, and I'm going to try and shake those up uh, before we send you off to lunch. So the first one is that older people don't belong in our fast-moving city and there's Puss in Boots off to the city to make his fortune. So oftentimes when we think of the city, we think of Carrie Bradshaw and the little black dress and Cosmos, or we think of a very hostile environment. And we, we can't a lot of the time imagine older people being in that city. Whereas in fact, if we take Dublin as an example, out of the population, 26% of the population is over the age of 50. And that if we look at the Dublin City Council area, that's, that rises to 27%. So for those of you who are thinking, well, older people aren't really part of the city, too bad. <laughs> We're already here. Older people are already one in four of the people who live in Dublin City. And I'm sure for a number of you in your cities, that percentage is even higher. So this is already an issue that you're facing. The second fairy tale is Hansel and Gretel there going to the cottage in the middle of the forest. But sure, don't older people all move off to a, a retire into the country and they disappear off out of the cities as they get older? Well, according to Richard Florida in his book, he is looking at what boomers, i.e. the people who were born after the Second World War, and where they're going. And they're actually moving into cities. And the reason why they're moving into cities is the same reason I live just on the other side of the river here. And it's the same reason why my neighbours who are older all enjoy living in the cities. They're there because they've got access to services. 
they're on the Lewis line to the, to the hospital if necessary. They've got a number of different shops on their doorstep. Everything is within walking distance. They've got access to those services. They're there because of the creative city as well. The city is always changing and remaking itself. And older people want to be part of that as much as anybody else. And the third reason that Richard Florida says is they're there for love. Or as the old romantic Richard says, they're there for repartnering. So if any of you are in the market for repartnering, cities are apparently the place to be. So the third fairy tale, and this is a fairy tale, I suppose, that people often accuse planners and architects of, is that if we build it, they will come. Um, and that's partly true. It's really important to build things and make things and make environments. But one thing that's quite um, popular at the moment is the concept of walkability. There's a lot of discussion about walkability and the idea that if we make environments more walkable, that somehow that's going to make uh, a better city for people, that's going to encourage people to get out there and do things. And when I started to think about walkability, I started to think about the fact that really you've got two different disciplines who are trying really hard to make it work. They're trying really hard to work together, but they're actually coming from two different perspectives. So on one side you have planners, and their idea of walkability is how easy or difficult is it to get from my house to the local pharmacy? How easy or difficult is it for me to get to my house to the local cinema? And it is about putting the map down and trying to map access routes for people to be able to walk them. And that's their understanding of the walking environment. Then on the other side, you have health promotion people. And their idea of walkability is how can we encourage people to leave the car at home? How can we encourage people that their first thought is, oh, I could walk there or I could cycle there rather than, oh, let's just hop in the car. And that this is one of those debates that's actually quite current in Ireland at the moment. People are talking about walkability. And let's face it, everybody wants to make it work, but it's coming from two different perspectives. So on the far side here, you've got the built environment, which is the environment of things, of all of the things that make up a city, from walkways to pedestrian crossings to monuments to buildings, all of those physical things. And that, I suppose, is oftentimes the realm of the planner. But then on the other side, there's this city that we all carry around in our heads, the city of safe or unsafe, the city of beautiful or ugly, the city of pride or disgust or shame. And that city is in every single one of our heads. And I think one of the things that walkability is trying to do and what we should all be trying to do is that these should be seen as almost an eclipse where the city that exists in people's heads should be the same or as close as we possibly can make it to the city of things. And in order to get to the city in people's heads, that means you have to engage with people. Now, from our point of view, and this brings me nicely onto uh, fairy tale number four, from our point of view, that's about engaging older people so that they have a real, because they've already got a city built up in their heads, and it's about trying to get them to engage with the real physical city so that we can start to have a more interesting dialogue. Um, oh, and one example, just before I move on to the fourth one, is that uh, Conswater, which is a green area up in Belfast that they've created, that Queens are actually doing, I think it's Key et al, are doing a study on the use of Conswater up in Belfast. And one of the things that they have found to be the primary reason why people are using this green space is because of social support. So that in itself is just another example of how actually engaging with the public makes the physical structure mean something. So basically they're encouraging walkability, people are using it, but it's because of social support. That's the major factor that they've found that is getting people into the green space. So there's the fourth fairy tale, is older people are an underused resource, and there's Rapunzel waiting, staring out the window as our fourth fairy tale. But in fact, older people, I believe that older people are an underused resource, but kind of not in the way that I often hear people describing older people. And I think it comes from this image that we have of older people sitting, staring out the window, waiting for somebody to call on them. 
that's the reality for a certain amount of older people, but the vast majority of older people are already involved. They're already engaged. Uh, in Irish studies here, that what we found is over a quarter of older people do regular voluntary work, over a third provide support for their adult children, and nearly half provide care to grandchildren. So if you're trying to engage a number of older people, a lot of them will say, and they'll mean it, I'm too busy. I'm far too busy. I don't know how I manage to work a full week and do all of the things I'm doing now. I'm busier now than I was before I retired. So the reality is that there's a lot of older people who are already out there. They're already engaging uh, in their environment. They're already doing things. They're already <coughs> making a difference. Now, apart from those people, then there's also a cohort of people who will never engage and will never get involved. Uh, you know, uh, let's take an example of somebody who's been a consultant their whole life. You ask them to get involved in a project and say, well, what is my fee going to be for this? You say, unfortunately, you don't, there isn't going to be a fee for this. Well, then, too bad, I'm not getting involved. So there are people who will not get involved for particular reasons. Then there is one group then for whom civic engagement is a possibility but they need to go on a journey. And this is where our experience in Age and Opportunity is helping to inform that. That what we've done is we've taken people on a journey through personal development where they really get an opportunity to figure out who they are and what they've got to offer, and then taking them into civic engagement. I suppose this is the reason why um, I was asked to speak here today because of the involvement that we're we're having with people. Now we've been running a couple of courses, Aging with Confidence and Taking Stock for a number of years. And what those courses do is that they ask people to look at what's happening to them physically in their own bodies, mentally, emotionally, gets them to look at the relationships that they're having with other people, gets them to look at things like assertiveness, gets them to look at sexuality and relationships, gets them to explore all of these areas so that you can actually figure out that very simple question to ask, but very difficult to answer, who am I now? You know, maybe I'm retired, maybe I'm no longer such and such, maybe I'm no longer mummy or mammy, or, you know, I'm no longer the mother, I'm no longer the father, who am I now? And that that's what those uh, courses that we've run help people to answer for themselves. But then there's the next stage. When people finish those, they actually want to go and do something. And that's why we've developed a, we call it a course, which is the community effect. But in fact, it's a process. And it, it uses community education principles. So it asks people, what are the skills that are in this room right now? and helps people to value those skills and say, well, I could do this or I could do that, and then helps the group to form, work together as a group, share skills, share leadership, and understand the, the ways in which things work in their, either in their community, if they want to make a change in their community, or broader at a national level to help people to understand uh, the, the mechanics of how lobbying works in Ireland, to understand the mechanics of how they could make a change in their local area, the mechanics of how they could support employment in their area. So this is what the community effect is all about. It's helping a group of people to set the agenda for themselves and supporting them in whatever ways we can. And obviously, in terms of that, that um, diagram that went from personal development through to civic participation, we want to see that arrow going on further and further and further so that more and more people are more involved and more engaged. That it's, it's no good if people just do the course and then by the end of it go, well, that was very interesting. Now, next week I'm starting painting. You know, the reality for us is that we want to see people doing things and that even though we've only run the community effect for a year and a half, uh, somebody has already done a, a master's thesis on it. And the research that they found from interviewing people who did it is that 90% became more aware of the issues within their community, 80% said it made a difference in their lives, and 62% actually went and did something. Now, some people did something um, that was quite significant. Other people did something that was quite intimate. But people, 62% of people did something. And for those of you who are involved in community development, 62% is pretty good as a result of doing a course over an eight-week period. 
Now, I suppose examples, just to be brief, one example was that a group of people who had run businesses down in Wexford, what they came to was that they realised that youth unemployment was a big issue in their area and that what they wanted to do is they wanted to support younger people to set up micro-businesses. So they set up a mentoring panel where they would provide free mentorship for people who were being supported by the community education uh, or the um, co- uh, community enterprise and that they are now providing that support to people. So that's something that's hopefully going to have an impact across the generations and in the wider community. But equally as valuable to us was a woman who did the course who her decision was that she was actually going to go and visit two of her neighbours on a weekly basis from now on. That's equally important because it's not about turning everybody into some fantastic uh, community leader and going off and building this wonderful empire. It's actually about everybody taking responsibility for who they are within their communities and going out and making a difference to other people and hopefully passing a lot of that on as well. So the reality is, and these are the, to boil it down just, um, away from the fairy tale, the reality is that older people are already part of your cities and that their numbers are actually going up and that potentially more and more older people will be attracted to the cities. So the older city will stop being called the older city, it will be called the city. It will just have lots of older people in it. The second part about it is, is that when we build the city, we have to be concerned about the city that is created within people's heads. And that's really important. And that the third side to that is that if one in four older people in Dublin is part of that city and we want to get into the heads of those four, one in four older people, then we need to be able to engage with them and we have to understand that it's a journey. It's not just about turning up on somebody's doorstep or knocking on their door and saying, tell me all about what you think about pedestrian crossings in your area. Um, so when we look at this in the context of big data, there's two interesting things about older people and big data, and this is what I'll finish on. Number one is older people, just like the rest of us, have all of the things in their wallet that contribute to big data. So I've got my Dublin Bikes card, I've got my transport card, I've got my library card, I've got my supermarket, Tesco club card, I've got my ATM. All these things are all gathering data all of the time. So I've got all of those, and there's lots of older people in the city have those as well. Maybe lots of older people in the city don't have one of these. But what they do have is they are starting to have more and more in their environments the kinds of uh, monitoring systems that are also data gatherers. So in a sense, that they, in a sense somebody in their 60s uh, potentially has more data gathering potential than somebody in their 20s who is relying on this and all the other things in their wallet to do their data gathering for them. So in that sense, older people potentially could be a great source of data. But the two other things that I would say about that are, number one, that it's really important with big data to disaggregate it. Like, let's actually look at different streams, particularly if our cities are going to be predominantly older people, then that's going to mean that the data, if we just take everything uh, in a single lump and say, well, majority rules here, then you're going to just see the data telling you one side of the story. And with Age and Opportunity, we believe that the story is an intergenerational story. It's not just about one age group or another age group. It's about the city working for all age groups together. And the second thing is that big data is not the whole story because what you can do is you can understand through things like desire lines running through fields and things like that. You can spot and plot certain desires people have, but big data won't show you all of the city in people's heads and that it's about using big data along with consulting and engaging with real people is when you start to get inside the city in people's heads. And who knows, maybe the city inside people's heads is a more beautiful, more imaginative, more exciting city than the city that we have at the moment. 
but that can be a starting point for creating that city in real life. So hopefully, if we use a lot of good big data, but we remember it's not the whole story, we can all live happily ever after. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. That was very good. Actually, the one thing before we break uh, that you reminded me when you're talking about big data and is it really good was a, a meeting that I attended, well, I think it was uh, November, October last year with Kevin, Kevin Leiden, um, Benita Leaps and, um, and Jack Craddock and in the room were the technology providers and they were all saying the trouble is we've got so much data that that's the issue, is handling the mass amount of data. And one person who worked for Jan Gell's architect said, well, have you ever thought, actually, you've got loads of data, but it may not be the stuff you need. It might be completely irrelevant. What do you really need to connect, to, to measure, me measure, monitor, and map, which comes back to Dick Leeson's um, opening lecture. So, thank you very much, Michael. I think that's... Uh, hopefully set the scene for you because it reflects some of my outlooks about uh, what we're actually here today. If I just put this up before you disappear, just to... Oh yeah, okie doke. We're starting back here at half past two, which I think is in an hour's time. What's the time now? Half past one? Half past one, okay. Perhaps, <coughs> excuse me, we could... Um, well, I'll tell you what I, my plan was. This is um, a map of where we are. Okay? Now, let me see. I don't have uh, a pointer, but you can see Dublin City Council on the left-hand side. Okay? There's some maps as well, I think, printed out for you. We are... <coughs> we are based here. Okay? This morning, a group of us came from Trinity College... And we wound our way from this area, travelling along these, this, these rows, these rows here. And Cow Lane is this one. So we walked along here, down across the road to where we are at the moment. Uh, I'm showing you the map because rather than sit here and have a sandwich and be indoors, I thought it was far nicer actually to go outside and just see the area, buy your own sandwich, whatever it is, and come back here. So, to do that, I'm recommending where we are. You need to come out, walk along, and there's plenty of places to, um, to have a, grab a cup of coffee, tea, a sandwich. Cow Lane's quite nice. There's a lovely little place there called um, the Queen of Tarts. I have no shares in it. It's what? Oh, slow service. <laughs> anyway, for the slow amongst us. <laughs> Um, yes, slowish, but rather nice. Along here, there's some cafes as well. And then as soon as you come to this place, Temple Bar, there are lots of little cafes you can grab something to eat, okay? It's half past one. I would actually suggest we come here at 2, 2.45, but be prompt, because you've got working groups. Oh, I've been told off. Okay, so 2.30. <laughs> you have to come back here at 2.30. Before you go... So she always keeps me in um, online. Before you go, there are 28 people so far bought tickets for tonight's Farrington uh, Irish Night. 